Dale Rasanella, it is great to meet you. Good to be here, Colin. Now, you've been a Catholic chaplain on death row in Florida for 25 years. Yeah. It, what is that moment like when you are sitting in the witness room next to the execution chamber? Well, after the botched lethal injection, which I witnessed, uh, it's changed uh, because I know that that could happen again. And so that's always in the back of my mind. But aside from that, assuming that everything is going the way it should, the person who's going to be on the gurney, strapped down, looking toward the window when the curtain opens, the curtain that separates the execution chamber from the witness room, is someone that I have gotten to know very well. And usually in the morning of that day, I've been with the condemned and his family, his mother, father, children, grandchildren, uh, in their final goodbyes. So what it is is all this human suffering, mm. and we're always mindful of the suffering from the crime and the family that is also suffering from the original crime mm -hmm. uh, is all coming to a focal point watching the person who the state is going to kill. And what I'm usually thinking is, is everything going as it should? Does, any, does it look like he's suffering in a way that he shouldn't, which is what happened with Angel Diaz in 2006? And uh, that was the botched lethal injection in Florida. And you were sitting there witnessing this? Yes. Are you talking about a wrong uh, mix of chemicals or not the right amount uh, administered to the person being executed? In that particular case, it can be that. And they've had botched executions from wrong chemicals and mixtures that weren't the ones they were supposed to be in other states. But in the case of Angel Diaz, who had been a lifetime Catholic from Puerto Rico, in his case, they had pushed the needles in too far in both arms. The needles that carry the fluid from the source on the other side of the far wall, those tubes come and the needles, the ports, if you will, that are in his arms had been improperly positioned. And so the chemicals were not going into his bloodstream, they were going into his tissue. Okay. And I saw him, the evidence of struggling, of suffering was incredible. With the autopsy that the Florida Supreme Court ordered the next morning after that execution, they found third degree burns inside his arms, both arms. In one arm, they were 11 inches long, the burns. In the other arm, they were 13 inches long. So we literally had burned him to death with chemicals instead of with electricity. It, it's, a, it's harrowing to listen to, and I know for some people watching too, it'll be difficult to take in, but yes. I suppose this is the reality of um, the execution process. I know this is a, a rare event, a botched execution, but of course we have to remember the, the horror of the people that you are dealing with day in and day out murderers, some people who have murdered multiple people, rapists. The agony that these crimes bring on the families of the victims is beyond words. And of course, what I'm always experiencing is, what if that was my son? Mm. What if that was my daughter? It's horrendous. I suspect that if I was ever the one sitting on that couch crying, my raw emotions would want revenge. Mm -hmm. My response as a person of faith, a Catholic Christian, has to be rooted in the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. When we talk about mercy, it's such an interesting concept. When does mercy begin and end? 
because you spoke so much about abolishing capital punishment and the death penalty, but you would admit too that some people need to be locked up for most of their unfortunately for most of yes. their lives. But if someone is re uh, repentant, if they've committed a heinous crime, should they be released early? Uh, where, you know, how much mercy should be shown? I don't equate mercy with being released. To my mind, mercy is part of our duty when we imprison somebody to help them find their way to be the person God intended them to be. Now, we can't go back and erase those prior 20 years when they were on drugs and alcohol and something like 85% of all the horrible crimes in Florida are connected with people being on drugs and alcohol. And I'm playing devil's advocate, Dale, knowing people watching this will have different opinions on the mm -hmm. topic, but you know, the argument that society determines the severity of a crime by the punishment it dishes out and that having capital punishment in place for, you know, very certain horrible, horrific crimes acts as a great deterrent and therefore saves more lives in the long run. I've heard that and there is absolutely no solid evidence one way or the other on the death penalty being a deterrent or the death penalty not being a deterrent. It seems to depend on other factors. And when you're sitting there, Dale, in the witness room, are you with the family? Or are you, who's there with you watching a, a normal execution, let's say? And it's different state to state, and it's different with the federal system. In Florida, the family of the condemned says their goodbyes in the morning. They have to be done before lunch. And then they have to leave the prison. And this is where my wife offered her services to get involved. And the bishops of Florida said, please, please do this. She ministers to the family of the condemned off site during that time from when they leave the prison just before 12 until the execution goes through or is stayed. Because sometimes a court order comes through to stop it until additional questions can be investigated. I heard you say before that they can sometimes go to a local hotel to watch the local news to find yes. out if the execution yes. has happened or not. So Susan will meet them wherever they want to meet, mm -hmm. but most of them want to be at church. Thank heavens. Mm -hmm. And the local pastor at St. Mary's of McClenny and his successor pastors have made St. Mary's of McClenny available as a quiet, sacred place where the family can come, the family of the condemned can come, and Susan will be there with them until I come from the execution at about 6.30 or 7 o'clock if it's on time. Sometimes it goes till almost midnight mm -hmm. because they're holding for a decision. And uh, tell them if it went through or if it was stopped, if it was stayed. Now, the family of the victim of the crime does not mix in with the family of the condemned. Okay. And that's just good security. Do they often come to witness as well? Do they want to see that execution? When I started doing this for the church almost 25 years ago, we're just a couple of months shy of 25 years, uh, it seemed the families of the murder victim frequently came. Mm -hmm. But in the last 10, 12 years, frequently they don't come at all. They're not interested in the execution. They know it's not going to do anything for them. And they'd rather stay away from it and just keep trying to heal from this whole mess. You don't think it gives them more, a more sense of justice knowing that the person who murdered or raped and murdered my loved ones is not alive and being cared for somewhere and possibly could be out someday, they're finally gone. Justice is a very difficult term. What the families of the murder victims desperately need, in my experience, is healing. My experience with families of murder victims when the death penalty is not involved is that they follow a very different route 
during the 15 or 20 or 30 years after the crime where their loved one was killed, then the families of the victims, when the death penalty is in play, the families of the murder victims when the death penalty in play is consumed in a legal process for decades. And frequently, when they come out of that witness room and the press sticks a microphone in their face and says, well, how do you feel now? Mm -hmm. Almost in exasperation, they will say, thank God. It's over. It's over. Mm -hmm. And so that's not really a statement of healing. That's a statement of we finally can get away from this. Why do you do what you do? With my wife, the reason we do this is that we have, for many years now, since I left my first career, been seeking what God needs for us to do. And he has put things in our path. And he originally put in our path the people suffering down in the streets in Tallahassee, the state capital of one of the largest states in, Flo in the country, uh, and halfway between the state capital and the governor's mansion is the worst neighborhood in the entire city. And we started working in a soup kitchen down there as volunteers. 1988. 1988. And what was happening was the people on the streets were being decimated mm -hmm. by AIDS. And so we said, well, this is what God has put in front of us. You were in the death and dying ministry. As a couple. As a couple. Yes. People on the streets dying. Yeah. But I remember a great quote I heard you say once, talking about the people you would encounter. You said, whether it was a homeless person dying behind a soup kitchen, a partner in a legal firm, an elected official, there was one commonality with the people you uh, administered to, and that was that they would never say, God, I hope you give me what I deserve. That's right. They all called for mercy in their dying moments. I've never had anyone ask me to pray for God to give them justice. It's mercy. Mercy. Everyone, even if they didn't think they had faith, when they're facing the end of the tunnel, everyone has asked me to pray with them for God's mercy. And of course, Jesus said, as you bestow mercy, so you shall receive mercy. And that's pretty challenging. And that is the mentality and the, the thought process that you bring into your work on death row, that no matter what they have done in their life, as heinous as it is, they too deserve mercy, is, am I right? Well, they too need God. They need Jesus. They need a way to see their life as God meant it to be. And I always, when a guy on death row tells me he wants to become Catholic, I found out that some of them have heard that if you become Catholic, the Pope will hire a lawyer for you, or the church will <laughs> yeah. give you money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's amazing what they've heard about Catholics in the Deep South. Uh, it doesn't happen. But I ask them, why do you want to become Catholic? And frequently they tell me, because that's the church that cares about me. When you're on death row today, what are the men and women asking of you? You're not a priest, you're not a brother, even though they call you Brother they Dale. They call me brother because that's a Baptist thing in the <laughs> South. Brother Dale. So when you, are they looking to, to confess? Are they looking for um, peace? Are they just looking for someone to talk to? Why do they want to sit in front of you? When we do cell front, and that's what it's called, you've got all these cells which are six foot wide and nine to 10 foot deep. And this is where they live, in that cell. You do not go into the cell, you pull no. up in a chair. We used to be able to go into the cells uh, before I started doing this. And there was a Catholic priest who was doing this for two years on assignment from the bishop. And he got beat up almost to death by a mentally ill death row inmate because he was in the cell. So for our protection, they don't allow us to go into the cells anymore, but we can stand right at the front of the cell through the open bars and speak. I can give communion. We can hold hands and pray. And what we're really doing is making sure they know that at least among 
our Catholic brethren and our Catholic Church, they have not been forgotten or cast away. We are here to accompany them. Now, I can't do legal work for them. It didn't take long for everyone to find out I had stepped down as a lawyer in order to do this. And, um, because you used to be a financial lawyer, so yes. when they ask you, look, you got to get me out of here, let's get the legal process. Yeah, and everybody needs a lawyer. Even if they got one, they need another one. Yeah. Uh, and that's not just in death row, that's also in long-term solitary confinement. But I'll share with you one actual experience. I was going at the very beginning, introducing myself cell by cell. I had the list from the warden and the prison chaplain of all the names of the ones who were Catholic, but I was saying hi to everybody, and this one fellow, and I didn't know yet whether or not he was Catholic, he comes to the front of his cell and he says, I'm so glad to see you, I wanna to talk to you. I hear you're a lawyer. And I said, well, you have to understand, brother, that the Department of Corrections required me to give up practicing law in order to allow me to do this for the Catholic Church. He said, well, what kind of a lawyer were you? And I, he said, Wall Street Finance. He said, Oh, that is such good news. And I said, help me, why is that good news? And he said, because if Jesus could forgive a grubby, money-hungry, thieving <laughs> Wall Street lawyer, he'll have no problem forgiving me for what I've done. <laughs> and there's a kernel of truth in that. What is the desire of my heart? That's what Jesus looks at. Mm -hmm. And I know what the desire of my heart was in my first career. I was making money hand over fist. Which isn't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. thing. And you were working in insurance, uh, building stadiums and airports and... Yes, not in insurance, but in actual, you know, project finance. Project finance. Seaports, airports, communication systems with satellites. So Dale is making money like it's going out of fashion down on Wall Street and you give it up to get into death and dying ministry. Why? We lived in the power neighborhood in Tallahassee. We had built ourselves a mini mansion, and I was only 35 years old. We were on the good life, we thought. And what happened is that as we started meeting and encountering the people who are suffering, the people on the streets, the people with terminal illness, the people abandoned in nursing homes and elderly homes, and we got to know their names. It's like the scales fell from our eyes. You realized that was the ministry for you. We realized that that was what met the need of our heart, was to be in relationship with these people and help them deal with their situation. That was the ministry God had called us to. Dale, for anybody watching this now who is on the fence, undecided about where they stand on the death penalty, what would you say to them? When my wife ministers to the family of the condemned and when I'm with them for the goodbyes in the death house the morning of the execution, almost invariably, the mother, the grandmother, the grandfather, the uncles, the aunts, the siblings, they look at us and they say, we never imagined this would happen in our family. But with drugs and guns so available, I mean, it's like water in the States. It's everywhere. A kid who's 19 or 20 years old and goes off half cocked, next thing you know, they've killed two people robbing a gas station and they've got a death sentence. No one ever imagined it would happen to people in their family. And the question is, if that was your daughter on the gurney, if that was your son on the gurney, what would you ask? And everybody says, I would ask for mercy. Dale, it's been great meeting you and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, it's been wonderful to have this time with you and thank you to your viewers.